pirate. The pirate is definitely a Mandalorian episode. Cameos, check. Action, check. This is the way. Although I'm not 100% sure what the way is anymore. This episode gives us a path forward that is both predictable and unexpected at the same time. G'day, I'm RJ. Welcome to the Nerdy Dad channel and my discussion of the Mandalorian episode, The Pirate. And let's make this an actual discussion. Let me know what you thought about The Pirate down in the comments. Chapter 21, The Pirate, is the fifth episode of The Mandalorian Season 3. And it was directed by Peter Ramsey, whose directing credits include mainly animation. But that animation includes Into the Spider-Verse and Rise of the Guardians, which are two of my favourite animated films ever. My non-spoiler thoughts? Once the action starts, it's fast-paced and it's fun. The Pirate is another self-contained adventure, but it definitely has ties to the ongoing story. And while the final two scenes are almost definitely propelling the story forward, there are other threads here and there that will play into the story of the era, even if they don't play into the rest of this season. I'm about to dive into the details. So if you haven't seen this episode yet and you care about spoilers, you might want to come back later. We see the Carson and Teva stuff from the trailers this episode. And this involves one of my ongoing annoyances in Star Wars, time and hyperspace. If you watched my Kenobi review, you know this is not a new problem for me. I know that Star Wars is a space opera, not a sci-fi. And I know that hyperspace is essentially magic and that space travel takes as long as the story needs it to take. But for whatever reason, it is still annoying to me. Carson hops between the Outer Rim and the Core Worlds rather than send a message. And I could be wrong, but I get the feeling that those refugees weren't out there for all that long. Now, but before that, the New Republic outpost is Cameo Central. We get the return of, well, for want of a better name, Director Squadron from Season 1. We get Dave Filoni's Trapple Wolf, Deborah Chow's Sash Kettler, and Rick Famuwaya's Jib Dodger. And of course, we see a wonderfully rendered CG Garazeb Aurelius. With the Ahsoka series coming soon, we're starting to see the ghost crew. Going back to the refugees, I do have another nitpick. There doesn't appear to be more than, say, 30 of them. Now, we do see some residents are still in the city after the evacuation. But even so, it's not many people for having evacuated the city. My best guess? It's a limitation of the volume. And they couldn't fit many more than that on the set. But that, and my problems with the hyperspace travel, are nitpicks. I really enjoyed the episode. From what we know of the New Republic, it makes sense that they're overwhelmed and over-bureaucratic, and it doesn't help that Kane is in um, Colonel Tarsier. It also makes sense that the Mandalorians don't jump to help Grief Karga. I mean, he was instrumental in the events that forced the Covert to leave Navarro in the first place. Okay, one more ongoing nitpick. How did the Covert get to that planet? The only ships we've seen so far are Dins and Bows. That said, apparently those two ships are more than enough. I also have a chuckle at the fact that everyone still calls Din the Mandalorian. I mean, what's in the drop ship behind him? Nerf Nuggets? As I said up top, the action is top notch, both in the air and on the ground. The armour is once again brutal. Who needs guns? And once again, Vayne escapes. That's three times now. Gotta wonder if he's just running, or if he's running to Moff Gideon, Thrawn, or whoever's running the Imperial faction. After the battle, I'm left with the thought of, how important is wearing the helmet to the way? I, like others, thought that it would be Bo that makes the Covert become more flexible, and that the armor is going to become an antagonist who refuses to bend. It's not that long ago that the armor rejected Din, and told him that he needed to bathe in the living waters to be accepted by the Covert. We already knew that Bo-Katan was tired of the divisions among Mandalorians. Apparently, seemingly out of nowhere to us, the armourer is too. I'm not surprised that Bo-Katan is on a mission to unite the Mandalorians. I am surprised to find that the armourer not only agrees with it, but it's her who set her on that task. I think this is the right way. Now, it's also apparently the way. And then at the end, we have the mystery of Moff Gideon's shuttle. 
I don't know what to speculate here. If the best car was from Mandalorians, was it from Mandalorians we already know? I think the worst case scenario was that the armorer is a scheming bitch and she had a hand in the destruction of Bo-Katan's castle. Now, I don't think that's the case and I hope that's not the case, but it is possible, provided the Cobra actually did have some ships hidden somewhere on that other planet. On that note, join me in a couple of days as I talk about chapter 22. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe to the channel here. This is the Nerdy Dad, signing off.